This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, I'm Rekha Sharma, and I played Landry on Star Trek Discovery. You are listening to The Edge on Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Welcome, listeners, to The Edge, Trek FM's dedicated podcast to Star Trek Discovery. I'm your host, Amy Nelson, and with me is the joyous Patrick Devlin. Pat, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing good, I guess. Uh, At least as far as the listeners are concerned. Yeah, I know. I'm glad to be here. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed watching this episode, and I enjoy talking about these episodes, so... uh, I'm happy right now. All right. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. Life happens. I am so extremely busy, but as far as the listeners go, I'm doing great myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, j- I just got unbusy. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> I have the opposite problem. So, <laughs> you know, life balances out. <laughs> yes. So, we are here to discuss season two, episode four, an obol for Karin. So, Patrick, you watch this. I want to know how many times because you usually get one more than me. <laughs> oh boy! Uh, well, since Friday at two o'clock, getting home, uh, I watched it twice on Thursday. I watched it twice on Friday. I think two more times on Saturday, and I just watched it about an hour ago. Oh my goodness! Okay, well then you've definitely outdone me. <laughs> this week, I'll just tell you, I I cannot believe how busy I have been and I did not get a chance to watch it on Thursday. So I missed that and so Friday late I got to see it and then I watched it again on Saturday and I just I've been so busy. So Yeah, I uh like I said my time freed up. So uh I um I had a bunch of time plus I knew last night I was taking my son to a wrestling show. Yes. So I was trying to cram in a bunch of watches before that. And uh, the show was good, except that the ring broke twice. Twice they almost died. Oh, yeah! It was it, it was unbelievable. Not gimmicked. I mean, it just the ropes actually snapped when someone hit them. Oh. They went over and landed on their skull. Everyone was okay, so that's good. Oh but, wow! Uh, it made it interesting for an eight year old who's never seen a ring break before. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's never not normal. <laughs> Why would the <laughs> no. rings break? I mean, they were old. Oh, and the ropes snapped, and then they so they took the top rope and made it the bottom rope, and just kind of held the bottom rope together with duct tape because you don't hit the bottom ropes, and then the new top rope snapped again. My gosh, it sounds like yeah. uh, Jet Reno was there with her duct tape. Yep, yep, yep. It, it actually reminded me of the episode, and I saw it. Maybe we needed a Jet Reno because she could fix it with duct tape, not just hope someone doesn't die with duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so but the show was good. My son had a blast. We were like right on the the um, the entrance way, the rampway. So we actually got a lot of high fives from the performers and stuff. Aww. And it was pretty cool. The, we made shirts. My son's favorite wrestler is a guy named Smiley, and he's a heel right now, a bad guy. But he came out from the curtain. We were right there at the curtain, and he looked down. He smiled, but you know he's not supposed to, so he kind of quickly looked yeah. away and <laughs> acted like he didn't see it, but he saw it. Oh, <laughs> so, so wonderful. Yeah, it was cool. We had a great time, and, uh, and uh, it has nothing to do with this episode except for the duct tape thing. Yeah. And, uh, but that's why I watched it so many times, because I, I didn't know how banged up I'd be from sitting at a wrestling show till midnight. And I didn't know if I'd get to watch it today, but I even watched it today too. So, yeah, well, I've had major technical difficulties. So postcards, I had to delay that. It just has not been my week, but I did get to watch it and I loved it. Um, I, 
You know, I loved last week's too, and this one was just as good. So different, but still good. But that's what's making this season so good. Two episode episode one was good. Episode th- two was great. Yes. Episode three was great. Episode four was great, and they were all different. Mm-hmm. This wasn't. So this wasn't as chaotic as I expected as episode four. You know, I was talking about that formula last week. Mm-hmm. So I expected this to be more chaotic, but there was still a lot going on and a lot of stories manifesting themselves. And I think next week, from what we see in this episode, we're going to have one kind of one overall story. It's not going to be as chaotic. Um, we'll get into that when we talk about Tilly. But so I, I think the, the chaos kind of slows down, but it wasn't as chaotic as I thought it was going to be, but it still had a bit of all over the place. But they did a really good job of tying those stories together. Mm-hmm. To work with each other. Yeah. And play off each other, even though it was chaotic. Right. Chaotic. So let's talk about this A plot, as you call it, this sphere that's grab discovery. Um, when I saw the sphere, I just, you know, my TNG brain, uh, thought of the inner light was first of all. With And most listeners should know that, and that's the one that takes over Picard, and he lives an entire lifetime in a few minutes. But again, getting this ancient civilization and its purpose was to let others know that this civilization existed. I also thought of masks because it, they talked about the age of this sphere thingy. I wish there was a name to it, so we'll just call it the sphere. And uh, with masks, like that was a very old and the asteroid built up around it. And it just really reminded me of that. And then with the whole empathy part really reminded me of Tin Man. And uh, so I don't know, they that was three distinct TNG connections that I made to it. Yeah. So if this was two years ago, I probably would have caught on to that, but I haven't really watched TNG recently because I've been doing this mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, Warp 5. So I didn't even catch that. But now that you say it, yeah, those are definitely three story elements that are here yeah. that were there. So, yeah, it's very interesting. They are they doing this quite a bit. They're calling back to older episodes. But again, in ways that if you don't catch it, you don't. It doesn't ruin the episode. Exactly. So again, this is kind of fan service done correctly, mm-hmm. where they're they're calling on those things, but you don't need to know. I didn't know that. I didn't catch that, and it still didn't ruin the episode. Right. So yeah. So what did you think of this sphere? I thought it was very Star Trekky. This this thing just snatches them out of the sky, basically. I mean, and puts them to a dead stop, and it's making this weird vibrating noise and. There's all this background radiation around it, and they don't know why, and they're talking about it. And then they, they talk about how big it is and how old. It's 100,000 years old. So they start talking about, oh, what could it have seen? I mean, we, I jumped way ahead. But, um, you know, at first they talk. It's uh, So interestingly enough, it's 565 kilometers in diameter. Okay, so compared to the Earth, the Earth is t- uh, 12,742 12, kilometers. So significantly bigger. Yes. Than that sphere, right? But it weight its its mass is six point three nine times ten to the twentieth kilogram. I know. I saw. Th- I heard that, and I was like, times ten to the what? <laughs> yeah. So this thing's made out of pure lead, apparently, or something heavier, because the Earth is only five point nine seven two times ten to the twenty fourth power. So okay, now I get it. It's twenty four instead of twenty, but that's not the size and is not it's not proportional right they're not the same ratio you know what i mean it's clearly much denser than the earth is mm-hmm. which i found it interesting because they say it's part they they did this kind of weird they said part organic and non-living material yeah like, i would have expected them to say part organic and non-organic mm-hmm. material mm-hmm. but they just said it in a kind of odd way so um but clearly that non-organic material is very dense yeah for them to get to that that saw so- that that density, that mass of, you know, six point six point three nine times ten to the twentieth. I don't know. You're the math teacher. That doesn't really. They're not the same density, right? Like this is clearly a denser object. Yeah. Than the when other. when I heard that, I was like, oh yeah, that's very very dense. So yeah, yeah. It's significantly <laughs> denser. I mean, it's massively denser. Um, which is interesting. I don't know. They, but hey, whatever. I got numbers finally, right? I was complaining about that like two episodes ago that we just keep getting. 
it's heavy. Yeah. Like anyway, that's they didn't do that at least. They gave us a number. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I was happy. And- one of the things that I loved uh, was the whole welcome. When Pike said, "Welcome to the Tower of Babel," and all the languages, like it made it so realistic, and we really felt that everyone's from a different culture, and you know, and and that Universal translators all messing up, and it just really to me felt like we understand how many different cultures are really inside the Federation. So I have one little problem with this. Okay. Okay. So the, you know, the way they present this, yes, at first, that's what it felt like, right? That we have this, the, like I speak English and you speak French and someone speaks something else or whatever. So the universal translator is now screwing up and it's giving us Klingon and Talaxian and all this. But at the end of the scene, Saru turns around and goes, anyone who speaks earth English or, or, Federation standard can speak to one another and they're all speaking English. That shouldn't happen. Either they could hear each other speaking English or they couldn't. Okay. That's interesting because what I thought you were going to say, because I think I remember you saying this uh, from season one is that if they're speaking and like the first time we see Burnham and she's speaking Klingon, her lips are moving the Klingon language. That too. <laughs> but I didn't even get that far because they, they don't even give you that. Right. Because I can understand it would be really annoying if someone was speaking French and we constantly saw them speak French, but English words were being subbed over them. Mm-hmm. So they have to like get rid of that episode to episode. That would just drive people insane to see moving lips that weren't working with the words that were coming across on the screen. Yes. But, but Saru says, anyone who can speak standard English or whatever, I forget the exact wording, but basically that's what he was saying. Anyone who can speak English, because we live in an English-speaking country, so that's the way this is recorded, uh, can now understand each other. Yeah, I guess that line doesn't really make sense, because if the translator is working, then whatever language you speak should be translated. Yeah, so why the need? Yeah. Or, if you all speak English, why did you hear the translator over the person that was standing next to you? If we were speaking English right now, right, and we were not on computers, we were in the same room together, Uh and it doesn't matter what the universal translator does, we would hear each other speak. It wouldn't filter through a computer to your ears. Right. You know what I mean? So, whatever. Look, I love the scene. It was funny. It was really, really funny. So, I said to myself, I'm just going to ignore this happened Mm -hmm. completely, and I'm going to ignore that line, and then it fixes it. But Because I didn't even think it's so deep as to, oh, they all speak different languages because they're all from different places. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. It it was a really funny scene when, because it happens in the middle of a sentence, basically. I mean, it's the beginning of a sentence, but in the middle of a conversation, it just goes haywire. And at first, (laughs) it's so sad. They tricked me. Because at first, I was like, what the heck? My computer... my." Am I getting some feed from somewhere else? Like what? <laughs> I don't get it. And then I realized, no, the translators. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it took a minute to figure that out. The other line that I found really funny is when Saru was like, am I the only one who bothered to learn a foreign language? And I thought to myself, yes, because there's a thing called a universal yeah. translator. So we're lazy now. <laughs> so of course you are. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, but that's just my take. I, I love the, I love the scene. Like I said, that one line just kind of, uh, and Whatever. If honestly, if we didn't speak about this show every week for an hour, I wouldn't even bring it up. Yeah, but we do, so I might as well mention it. So one of the there were a couple of things that I loved within this story plot um, was, you know, we re- we understand now that Saru and Burnham they're like they're trying to figure it out, and Saru's like they're not we're not making first contact. But last contact. Oh my gosh, I got the chills with that because we're so used to making first contact. And then they realize, oh, this is its dying wish is to be known. And again, how they tied that in with Saru's story of him learning languages, of him trying to learn, and then realizing during his, you know, sickness or during his death story plot that he didn't get to share his culture. And so I loved that they changed that wording from first contact to last contact. Yeah, absolutely. I loved it. Because obviously we're making first contact with this thing, right? But it's making last contact with anybody. Mm -hmm. And we just happen to come by. Like, lucky it. Because maybe it's not the Federation. You know, if it's the Klingons, they just die trying to fight it. And then nobody remembers this thing ever existed. Um, I am interested to see if we do anything with the information we got from this. 
I mean, it makes sense that we eventually ran into something that was 100,000 years old and knew a lot because whenever we go, and I know you don't want to hear it, so don't yell at me, but whenever we go to another series, they're always talking about stuff that they really shouldn't have knowledge of half the time. Like, they look in their computers and they find all this information. Well, this answers that, right? We just found a creature that's 100,000 years old. That's a lot of information to compile. We don't know where it's been. It could have been just outside Earth for most of our history or just outside Vulcan or Romulus or whatever, or it could have been floating around space Mm -hmm. for a hundred thousand years, just collecting information Yeah, and in different quadrants and everywhere. Yeah. So, so anytime we've got a piece of information that we don't know where it came from, now we have an excuse on where it came from. So let me give you a theory. Um, because you haven't listened to postcards because it hasn't been dropped yet. Um, so, listeners, sorry, the duplication, but I think it's so interesting. This uh, One of the fans said that maybe this sphere is what helped the Discovery computer gain her sentience as an AI that leads us to Calypso a thousand years later. Well, that's interesting. I, You know what? That, that is possible. Um, because we do have ties to the shorts in this episode yes. with Saru. So it wouldn't be that crazy to have more ties with the ship, or at least eventually harken back to this as being part of the precursor that leads us to that short. Right. And one thing that I, again, just loved about this storyline um, is Captain Pike. When he makes that decision to let the shields down, and, you know, communicate and talk to it. And and he says, and I just think it's such a great character point and what's making Captain Pike nearly my number one, but I'm still holding out. Picard's still there, but I'm almost there, especially when he said it is, you know, in my conscience, it's my ethical and moral responsibility to do that. And I just flipped out over that line. I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. This is exactly what Picard and obviously Pike would do is to trust his, you know, uh, crewman, you know, and to trust in this idealistic Federation morale of we need to reach out and contact. So, yeah, I love that, too, because you you have in that scene, you actually have Saru come in and say, hold your fire. And he's like, I think I'm dying because it's dying. Like, we'll get into that with Saru, how he dies because of it. But that's what was said. And I, Again, this is Pike being Pike. Come again. You know, he, you know, he just has that very lax kind of way of talking which is pretty awesome mm-hmm. but he's like you have to run by that by me again because i don't quite understand why you're dying because it's dying because i'm dying because it's dying because that matters like and he's like no listen to me and he does and the best part of it is he does talk about it as a starfleet captain that it's his duty yep. that if you're even half right that i need to get this information but he also says my morals say i have to do it too yes. it's not just that i'm part of starfleet that i I can't just let this thing die and be forgotten. Yeah. That's not, that's not right. It's asking for help and I need to help it, you know, have its legacy live on, which is, isn't this whole show about legacy? Like literally all of discovery is about legacy to this point. Burnham being a mutineer, Burnham fixing that Laurel being, becoming the chancellor. It's all about their legacy Mm -hmm. in the universe, not just the Star Trek in their universe. You know what I mean? Like, so so this is this would be an important thing that this is about its legacy moving forward. So I want to ask: Did you feel that the sphere plot was different from the Saru plot, or are you putting those two together as one? I sort of view it as two separate. But I was having a conversation yesterday with Tim Robertson, and he's like, "No, it's the same plot." No, I don't see it as the same. I, I see them. I actually see four plots on this show. One of them is very small, but I, I find there to be four plots as an A, B, C, and D, um, which Discovery is doing a lot of jamming a lot of plots into episodes, but they're doing it in a way that it's okay. It doesn't, none of them take away from each other, but I do find that plot A and B are heavily influenced by one another. Yeah, they are very parallel and and I think on purpose, I mean, because we're looking yeah, no. at, yeah, the sphere and then we mirror that with Saru. Absolutely. And while we're doing that, I mean, I think they, it wasn't just that. I think as they were writing one, you know, maybe this sphere ca- idea came out of them writing Saru's sickness. Right. And they said, oh, you know, we can also do. And then they wrote these two as a single episode. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they're this a single 
plot. Because, look, the sphere dies at the end of this, right? It blows up, yep. and it reverses polarity at the last possible second. And I love the way they even word that, because they didn't just say, oh, it saved us. Because, no, it, it, I don't think the sphere really cared about you either way. It saved us so we can tell its story right. is an important line in all this. Yeah. Because it did it so that, because if, if you die, well, this was all pointless. Exactly. So it saved the information and its purpose. Yeah. It's legacy. It saved its legacy. Yes. And that's all it wanted to do. And I think it was amazing because, look, we kind of jumped over it real quick. First, it infects the ship with, um, by going after the universal translators, which makes sense because it's trying to talk. So it's trying to get a hold of that system, right? Now, while that's happening, it starts to infect other parts of the ship. The way they fight back is with, with an antibody, you know, antibodies, electronic antibodies that are going to work like army ants. I, it was really cool wording, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I found it funny the way it was explained. And then as they're pushing this out, Saru finally realizes at some point he's seeing its language in ultraviolet light. Basically, Morse code. I don't know why they don't say that wording. Oh, you thought there. Morse code? Because I was yes. thinking binary. I, that makes sense yeah. too, but isn't binary kind of a version of Morse code? Because Morse or Morse code is a type of binary language. Because all it is is beeps and not beeps. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like Morse code is a beep, a hold, or I guess it's not binary since it's three, but yeah. it's close because it's beeps, holds, and blanks. Yeah, would make up Morse yeah, code, and really it's just beeps and holds. Yeah, ones and zeros, ones and zeros, ones and zeros. Exactly. So. Um, but they didn't say either one of those, and they should have at some point, binary or Morse code or something. Yeah. Because just the way he explained, I keep seeing flashes. It, to me, that was like, you know, like like flashing a light, yep. you know, for soldiers would do. Yeah. So, um, but that's what they were talking about. And I found that interesting because that's exactly how I think, because I don't think it's an overly sophisticated life form, if that makes sense. Even though it lived 100,000 years. I don't think it had the ability to learn English, let's say, and talk to them. Mm -hmm. This was the only way it had. And unfortunately, it ruined the piece of technology that would have helped them talk mm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could have gotten to this, getting the information a lot sooner if it wouldn't have ruined. But it was doing what it thought it had to do to get its information to someone else. Yeah. Well, and I think it sort of ties in like with the engineering because it was trying like with the sound, you know, that Burnham was like, well, this is what it would sound like, these vibrations. So you've got, again, these vibrations that I was thinking, oh, they're trying to communicate, again, in my mind, mathematically, because music is math. Um, and then with the flashes of lights and then this supercharged, you know, energy that they had to dispel in engineering. And so I was like, it it's, was just trying to communicate in every type of form that it knew sound visual energy you know right and i think but see like you say in my mind because you're a math teacher but i think that if we've learned anything from science that the most likely way to communicate with someone who doesn't speak our language is going to be math mm -hmm. to an outside species math is the one thing that could be constant, because even if they don't have the same numbers, one, two, three, four, they understand counting things. Obviously, they had to count things in order to build yep. whatever they're using to talk. Math had to play a role in it. So, you know, it makes sense that all of this seems to be some kind of mathematical equation for talking. It, that makes the most sense to me. And I look, I could be totally wrong and science could be totally wrong. And we could find out one day that the other planet speaks English. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Yeah. But it's more likely that we are going to find a way to communicate somehow with images and math mm -hmm. that, you know, so that makes the most sense on why it would be talking in vibrations and repeating patterns of light and yep. yeah, patterns, viruses. Exactly. So that that makes the most sense. Yeah. And another way it was trying to communicate with Saru specifically because of his immense empathy that he was now feeling that. This sphere is not trying to hurt us, it's trying to communicate with us. So again, we get almost this telepathic, this empathic communication yeah, as well. Yeah, Troy. Hey. We, we have Troy. You said so it, not me. I but I, that's I, it's exactly what I thought, and I thought, oh, now he's going to be Troy. So <laughs> hey, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I, so, I if they, uh, whatever. Well, anyway, so <laughs> I don't know if it was trying to do that, but that I think it was just a happy accident that Saru's on the ship. I, I don't, you know, I don't think yeah. 
the spear went out of its way to do that, but it, that's ultimately what ended up happening. Right. Is that, and we, we'll get into that deeper because that plays big into the next plot point, which is his sickness, but I think that all of this comes about because of the the sphere dying that he's able to figure this out and you know so he yeah he's em- empathic to a degree you know but only when it comes to death mm-hmm. which is interesting because they're just like they did with troy they're now limiting what he feels right you know like he can't tell oh that guy's lying mm-hmm. he can't you know troy couldn't troy's race half race could read minds just know what you're thinking so they limited her there because that would just be way too overblown yeah and way too then they'd never be in any kind of trouble right. so they gave her the ability to feel feelings mm-hmm. just understand feelings so basically you could treat her like a lie detector test and if you just thought good thoughts even though you were lying you could probably get out of it that was kind of how i took that writing mm-hmm. but now we have him and he kind of has a similar ability but only with death mm-hmm. So, which I found interesting. Yeah. So, talking about Saru's sickness, Vahari, as we now know, um, yes. do you think that it was caused by the sphere? Uh, from what the episode tells us, yes. Okay. I, I didn't, when he was explaining it, I didn't, but I, I'm not going to contradict the writers. Yeah. And so... What do you think about this whole him thinking that he was going to die and then ended up not? I think that what they're trying to convey to us, or at least what I took out of that, is blind faith is dangerous. Faith itself is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I don't, I personally don't think. I'm not, I've said it before on this podcast, I don't go to church. I don't go every Sunday, but I don't see going to church every Sunday as a bad thing. What I find is blind faith. Mm -hmm. Never questioning why you have your faith because you can be run, not that every church does it, not that most churches do it, but you can be led in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And if there's nothing that shows you that your faith is correct, if you're not questioning it to some degree, then you're you're more likely to go the wrong way Mm -hmm. than if you do question it. And look, scientists have gone the wrong way and done the wrong things. We've had bad scientists that have created terrible data. Mm-hmm. And that's that's science-based. That's fact-based. But when other people questioned it, we get the right answer right. eventually. Yeah. So, you know, I think that we need to question why our motives are what our motives are at times. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we're bound to do the wrong things. And that's true of everything in life. You know, um, we had a president that said, trust but verify. Yes. I, just because I agree with what you're saying doesn't mean I should just buy the rest of what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, verify. Exactly. I like that. Yeah, when I was you know, watching this and seeing Saru get sicker and sicker, or more sick, more sick, whatever the English is. Um, you might have just named this. <laughs> I... I thought it was a very beautiful progression because we see him, you know, at the conference table and he's adding all this salt. And I thought that was so cute. Kelpian, I get it. And and then when he's on the bridge, like, you know how difficult that is. And I just, I'm telling you, Doug Jones did such an amazing job because while he was in engineering and trying to help, like, I know that I've tried to push myself and just go even when you're sick and I haven't had any near death experiences but that idea of just pushing through and how he was you know walking to station to station and his hands on his hip and he was leaning over and you just knew that there was something seriously wrong and he tried not to talk about it you know and I respect him because you know when I'm sick just leave me alone don't talk to me about it Um, And I just, I really felt like the whole acting through his sickness was just brilliant. I was able to connect so much with him and what he was going through. Yeah. So the one time I've had the flu in my life, I've had the flu. um, I was working, I was an apprentice at the time and it's, it's very much looked down upon to miss work in my industry. We have a lot of time out. Um, between furloughs and layoffs and other things. So it's very, very looked down upon to miss work. We don't even have sick days. It does not exist in my industry. Mm. So 
when you're sick, even if you have the flu, you get up and you go to work. That's just the way it's always been. I mean, that's lessened up a bit recently, uh, but there's still a lot of people who have the old school mentality of you get sick, you still go to work. I got sent home from work. I was so sick. I mean, I had the flu. I didn't know I had the flu when I showed up, but I left at like coffee time, which is like nine o'clock in the morning. We start at seven. So I went straight to the doctor, found out I had the flu. I slept all of that day and I was back to work the next day on antibiotics and I still had the flu. So I understand. I completely empathize with his walking around like an old man. I mean, he was walking around like a crippled old man. And I know that feeling because I was trying to do electrical work. In that condition. I mean, I wasn't dying, but when you have the flu, mm-hmm. you almost wish you were because mm-hmm. it's that the flu is that bad. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I liked it. Uh, my point of that is I liked it. I, I did. I felt something for him. I felt even before we knew he was dying, mm-hmm. I felt for him. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he's getting mad when they're trying to talk to him because all he wants to do is go back and do his job. Mm-hmm. And then he finally admits, I'm dying. This is the end. So there's nothing, you know. There's nothing you can do for me. Just let me do my job until it comes, and then I'll go. Yeah. And I found that to be a very powerful scene. And I also did not believe that he was going to die at that moment. Oh, man. I They had me going, Patrick. And you know how well informed we are because we do the podcast, and so we're always on social media. And I literally, more than once, I was like, are they getting rid of Doug Jones? How did I not hear this? I And I seriously, I was like, are they going to kill him off? I was getting pissed in between my tearing up because I'm like, how did I miss this? Doug Jones is such a humongous part of Discovery. And I was believing that he was going to die. It was so good between him and Sonequa. Okay, so at this, and I make the distinction that I did not believe it at this point because, and I think this is amazing writing. I think they knew that some people weren't going to buy it, that some people know he has a contract for X amount of episodes or whatever, right? So I'm not one of them. I have no idea what his contract is. I just didn't believe they were going to kill off a character of this importance at this moment. And, but when they all stood up on the bridge, I was like, oh my, no, he's really dying. Like, there's no way they would make them all stand up if he wasn't really dying. Yeah. So it's amazing writing because now I I do I didn't believe. I thought this is a great story. They're going to find a way to fix this. Someone's going to come up with a cure. Or I didn't ever see what we saw coming. But the moment they all stood up, I was like, oh, no. Oh. It is true. And I'm not the biggest Saru fan. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. But I've I've ever since his short, I've been, or ever since we started talking about the characters, yeah. I've- gained a much better uh, respect for the character. And the fact that they've kind of made the Ganglia a joke to this point of this season has made me feel all the things I didn't really like about him. So, and we get into that soon too. But when they all stood up, I was like, oh man, I'm going to miss him. And it's funny because I thought to myself right after that, oh man, if this happened three episodes, I wouldn't even care. Yeah. Like, but now I care a lot. Yeah. This is terrible. <laughs> okay, so glad I wasn't the only one. Because and they took it to the very end. You know, it just—it was unbelievable. Yeah. I, I the, the storytelling of this story was amazing. The way they tied it back to the discovery itself mm-hmm. and being held by that ship was uh, by the sphere was amazing. I mean, you really felt for him through this whole thing. He, he couldn't do. You would think he couldn't do anything. And meanwhile, he's figuring out things to do, the antibodies yeah. to fix this first problem. And, um, you know, the scene where he's where Burnham's like, no, you don't have to come with me. I can do this. And he's like, with the state the ship's in, you're going to need a translator just to operate the turbo lift. Yeah. Which is weird because she speaks Federation standard, which is English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. The turbo lift should speak English, but whatever. So one thing that really got to me was when Saru asks Michael to cut off his ganglia to put him out of his misery, you know, basically this ritualistic death. And when he started asking her that, uh, again, another TNG connection of ethics when Worf 
when he gets paralyzed. This one I caught. And <laughs> this one I caught. <laughs> you caught this one? Yeah. Yes. And so Warfast yeah. Riker, you know, with a ritual knife, Klingon knife to end his life because it's the warrior's death. And Saru is asking the exact same thing and has this special knife to do this ritualistic killing. And I just, to me, I just saw that. And I, I mean, I was already tearing up when he said, you know, would you go through my personal files? And I was like, oh my gosh, he's really thinking this is his end. And then to ask that of Michael, I, I just, I, I, well, one, I don't know if I know anyone well enough that I would, could ask that. I don't know if I, look, there are a few people in my life. There are, there, I have a couple people. I'm very lucky that would do just about anything I asked of them, mm-hmm. but I don't think they'd do that. Right. And even if they would, look, I, I can actually tell you that I have a good friend, Brian. Um, and if he's listening, he knows, you know, which Brian it is. Cause you're my daughter's godfather that he would probably do it but i would hurt him so immensely by even asking that mm-hmm. that i couldn't do that to him mm-hmm. you know i i mean i've never been in the situation where i was dying so i guess if i had cancer and there was nothing left maybe that would cross my mind and maybe i would i, I cannot put myself in someone's shoes who's in that situation right. but I, I knowing sitting here being a relatively healthy person in good you know condition I don't know if I could ask someone that and put them in that position to even have the chance to say no to it. So, because you're in a no win. Saying no to me, you know, is going to make me suffer. Mm-hmm. But I'm not a dog or a cat. Yeah. You don't just put humans down. I mean, it's not it's not that black and white. Mm-hmm. And putting cats down or dogs down is not that black and white to some people. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I have a dog that's he's on his last leg. He he's almost there and it's really hard to come to grips with even that. And he's just, uh, he, I, uh, for people who don't have animals, he's just a dog. You know what I mean? But for people who have animals, they understand the difference. Yeah. And now take that as someone that is a human. Mm-hmm. I mean, in reality, that's what we're talking about here. Right. Even though he's not, he's a Kelpian, but yeah, he, you know, he's a human. He, and, a very important part of Michael's life as we find out. now. Yes, definitely. They're not at wits with each other. They're not, battling each other anymore they're they've basically become brother and sister like saru says to mm-hmm. her and can i just say i don't know how she can cry that well oh. without someone actually dying you know what i mean like yeah. I, it's just uh, she, that was amazing acting to cry the way she cried well one thing that i thought again sort of interesting with his story w- was when He's thinking, I mean, mind over matter. So his thought processes, and this goes back to what you were saying with blind faith, like he's been told, he's been raised, he only knows that when his threat ganglia gets swollen and this whole Vahari syndrome comes on him, that he is going to die. So his mindset is believing that he is going to die. And so that's... There's no other option for him because that's how he was raised and told and taught. And then to not have it happen that way that his threat ganglia fall off are no longer useful and it changes not only his personality and how he feels, but that whole mindset of I am not going to die and how empowering that is going to be for him. I am super excited to see this new Saru. So am I. I can't wait. And what's amazing about this is, okay, so I had a few questions about this whole thing because they cut off the threat gangly and they die instantly. That doesn't seem right to me to begin with. I guess that's what's happening on the planet, but we don't know that they've ever actually seen someone go through that procedure. They might've just been killed because the people who are controlling the religion on that planet are making sure that people don't see what happens afterwards. The Ba'ul and the cult. Yeah. Right. But that, is it really the Ba'ul that are coming down and cutting off their thing? I think they're doing it to themselves, right? Well, I think so too. Or that if they get, if they realize that they've got this Vahari, then they go and they are ones who are sacrificed because there's. Well, they are. Yeah. He says that. He says, but if they don't get chosen, yeah. they go mad and then they're killed. Well, or is his father, who's one of the ones that run the religion, right? Is his father just killing them and telling people they went mad? 
I don't want to think that. Maybe not, but it's it's definitely a po- distinct possibility. And because he says cutting that the ganglia will kill him, right? Mm-hmm. But then they just fall out. So maybe cutting them wouldn't have killed him. Or is the blood loss that high? They have to die from killing because that's what's been done previously. Well, that's what they've been told. Well, so if someone's cutting off the threat ganglia and they're still living, no, that would have come out in uh, centuries of. Oh, we sure because it didn't come out the fact that if they don't, if they don't get cut, we don't go mad and we're not afraid anymore. Well, that's why I think when they are getting swollen and Bahari, then they do get cut and then they do die. I think it is. I was sort of thinking tonsils. I mean, I know it's not that, you know, one-to-one. Right, but, but if, if I you stab know, your tonsil, you don't drop dead. I, that's why I'm saying it's not a one-to-one relationship. Like, <laughs> But, you know, people have tonsils, but all my life, everyone's like, you need to have your tonsils out. You need to have your tonsils out. I still have my tonsils, and I'm living so quite happily and fine, and I rarely get sick. I don't get strep throat. Like, all these things that are being told, but it's like, well, you need to have them done. You know, and I'm just like, well, they, they don't believe in that anymore either. Yeah. Uh, well, actually. when we, my <laughs> age, <laughs> me too. My sister doesn't have them. None of my friends have yeah. them. I have my tonsils and my adenoids, and so does my wife. Interestingly enough, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. I forgot that was even a real big thing because because they don't. They actually do not believe in that anymore. That's like for rare cases huh. now. Oh, interesting. Yeah, most people still think you just have them taken out, but doctors don't really do it as much as huh. they used to. Because uh, they found out it didn't. My sister still had strep throat every year, hmm. and she has nothing. She has no no adenoids, no tonsils, and whatever. But uh, yeah, and I have everything, and have, didn't really don't get strep throat. Yeah, so. me neither. Anyways, we yeah. digress. But you know, I it's an organ <laughs> in your body, and obviously a very important one because if you take it, if you remove the ganglia too early before it's naturally comes out then you die. I guess. I don't know. It's like a day too early if you're at this point. But so I, to me, it's like ripping a tooth out right before the tooth's ready to come out. Yeah. I think the tooth, it would just, you would just naturally fall into the next phase. So, okay. But I liken this in my head kind of to puberty. Like this is full maturation of the individual. Okay. And now they've come to their full version of adulthood once this falls out because they're no longer afraid. That's what we get to, right? He's no longer afraid and he feels powerful. And I think that's extremely important that that's the next step for this race. And that's why the Ba'ul forced them to be chosen if this happens. Right. Because if enough of them ended up in that position, they'd fight back. And they don't want someone who's fighting back. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think it is some type of, well, I don't know if it's because of the Ba'ul, but the Ba'ul have recognized that and want to keep the Kelpians docile and under control, and this is one way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's, there's no accident here. I believe, And I believe this actually ties all of this together. This ties Saru's stories to being a prey race. Mm-hmm. I don't think they were. Right. I don't think they were running around their planet being herded. I don't think that ever happened. I think they were taught these stories because the Ba'ul was so strong they could kill the race if they wanted to. And... They convinced a bunch of elders, I'll call them elders, but whoever was running the society at the time, they convinced them, you need to teach your people these stories or we'll wipe you out. And if they get to this point, you're going to send them to us and tell them that they were dying anyway. And if they they don't, you're going to stab them in their ganglia and you're going to kill them somehow. And you're going to tell people that it was because this was happening. And if you don't do all these things, we'll just wipe you out and no one will ever remember you. And once again... The elders of that group were looking to make sure the legacy of their survive their society survives, and we're back to this legacy issue. Yeah, this episode did so much to fix up the few little problems I did have with that short. That all we heard about was they're a prey species and they're herded together and this that, and the other thing, and then we find out that never really happened. And this this episode fixes that problem because you don't need it to happen. You just need that they believe it was happening. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so we're back to the blind faith problem. Yeah. He's willing to kill himself. Yep. Thinking he's dying because he just believed what he was told. Yep, that mindset. Now, right. Now, whether his father believed that or knew that this was the outcome, 
I want to find out. Mm-hmm. I want to be honest. I'm with you. I don't want to believe his father knew, but I think it would make for great television. Yeah. If he went back and confronts his father about mm-hmm. this. Well, and you can tell that he wants to because there's a fire in him that he needs Absolutely. to correct what's happening. Absolutely. And look, so he's going to confront his father one way or another, unless his father somehow died between when he left and now, which is possible. But let's just say his father's still alive on the planet. He's going to confront him, but I actually want him to confront him. Uh, let me take that back. I think it would be amazing television if he confronts him and his father knows the truth. Right. I was just thinking that when you were saying that, I'm like, what if the elders are the only survivors that don't have their ganglia? (gasps) Oh, drama. So, right. So, and if they know the truth, that would be great TV. Again, I don't want him to have been lied to from his father on purpose, but, but if it has to happen, this is the story it should happen in. Yes. Okay, so before we go any further, I do want to talk about what's happening in engineering. Uh, Jet Reno, I just really have to say I wasn't that big of a fan of hers, but I'm really liking her now. Oh, I love her. Do you? I love her. For, yes, I love she. Okay. I know. I Sorry, listeners. I do talk about being an electrician a lot. I get it, but I do because I'm. Well, quite honestly, I'm proud of it. Um, <laughs> and she is such a worker. She's such a blue collared worker in New York City, at least, that she would fit in any shanty I've sat in and be able to hold her own with all the other, I can't say that, uh, people who bust chops. Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's what they do. They talk just like her. They act just, I can fix that with duct tape. Yeah. I can fix that analogy with duct tape. And she, she the, when she feeds the line to Samus where, oh, you're the one who makes a joke because you have nothing better to say. Like, you have no comeback. You get mad. That's exactly what we do. And man, if we knew that bothered you, we would push that button all the time, just like she is. She out Stamets Stamets. Because <laughs> that's who he was last year. He was the guy that found out what annoyed you yep. and just jabbed on that button. And I think that's why I wanted to hit him. But now that she he, she he has an someone who's an equal or better at it, I like them both. Yeah. It's perfect. They're perfect. They should they should be together all the yes. time. <laughs> and uh it was so funny cuz I'm a school teacher. I we talk about our jobs a lot, but <laughs> I'm we proud do. of it too. <laughs> and but it also it it plays into how we see a lot of these characters. Yes, absolutely. And when she asked Tilly, "Do you have any gum?" Any one of my students know it is a no gum zone in my classroom. And when she asked for gum and I was like, first of all, why are you asking for gum? No, there's no gum. And then Tilly had gum. I'm like, seriously, who has gum? But then she all MacGyvered it and used it to, you know, put something there. I just laughed. and I thought, okay, okay. All right. So two things. (laughs) One, when she asked for gum, I actually thought of you because you've yelled at me for having gum on a uh, patron's uh, zone once Uh because I was trying to quit smoking. And uh, two, that's so us. Uh Like we, so many times we get something that's supposed to be fixed and man, you just, it's not, it doesn't work the way it's on paper. And so we make the joke about using spit and bubble gum, the whole thing's together all the time. Oh my gosh. So as soon as she asked for it, I knew that it's exactly where that was going. Uh That's funny. And I was like, this is great. Until he's like, grape. And I'm like, she doesn't care what flavor it is. She's just going to use it to hold something together. Yeah, but that was was so Tilly. Grape. And who chose grape? Obviously, Tilly. I mean, that just fits her character. That's my favorite flavor of everything. Oh, my gosh. If you want me to eat or drink something, make it grape. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That's too funny. Oh. (laughs) So... I have to give props to Mary Wiseman because, again, I have I, I like her just fine. She hasn't been my favorite. But I'll tell you, this episode, I am 100% on board with Tilly and with Mary Wiseman. Well, I've always been on board with Mary Wiseman. But when she, this whole episode, she's smart, she's intelligent, she's fearful, she's honest, she's raw. And then when we see her click over to May, that sent chills like creepy chills because it was 
so successful, so convincing. We were not talking to Tilly. That was May. And the way that Mary Wiseman was able to do that, seriously, I got the chills. I had to shiver. And I was like, this is turning into some scary horror movie. And when I saw it and the preview for next week, I totally thought of Stranger Things in the Upside Down. Because when they're looking in, oh my gosh, and they're looking in that creature. Yeah, I, I know what part you're talking about. I haven't watched Yeah, uh, I totally was like, oh, it's the upside down in Stranger Things. So, so this is continuing down the, this story is a horror movie path. Yes. Right? This, I mean, it's, it's, it's still following typical horror movie filming techniques and whatnot. But okay. Listeners, if you aspire to be an actor or an actress, just watch the Tilly scenes here because her range of facial expressions is un, un, un unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Like even when she's like, when he's like, "Well, how do you know May isn't trying to hurt you?" Well, she was annoying and wouldn't shut up, and that's not typical Tilly faces. Yeah. But she's kind of like fed up with May at this point, and it shows amazingly because she's also kind of high, mm-hmm. so it shouldn't be perfect. But she gets across those faces in a I'm high, but I'm still disgusted way, which is amazing. And she's so raw when she's like, you know, I wasn't really liked as a kid. And, you know, it just. Oh, I felt so bad for Everything her that I, she, you're right. But, Every, that whole, this whole episode about Tilly was just amazing. We got to learn so much about her through it. We did. And so I think it's it's somewhat common. It's not everyone, but there was a lot of people who love Star Trek that were kind of the weird kid. Mm-hmm. Oh, you yeah. Know, they, they were bullied. It comes up a lot. Like when on Warp 5 recently, we did an interview with somebody who it's their first time watching Enterprise and they're a Star Trek fan. And they said, it. look, I was kind of bullied as a kid. I wasn't a popular kid. And I said in that episode, I was kind of bullied as a kid too. And I'm a big kid, which made it worse because when little kids can pick on big kids, mm-hmm. it makes a little kid look even better. Mm-hmm. And they don't really don't stop. Um, and it wasn't until I stood up for myself and that all stopped real quick. But it took a long time for me to get to that point. And Tilly is, I think that's why a lot of people identify with her. Mm -hmm. Because they were also bullied and treated badly and didn't have a lot of friends. And in this one, she's like, well, there was this other weird kid that really, you know, reached out to me and I didn't treat them, I didn't hold them on the same pedestal that they kind of held me and I was wrong for that. Mm -hmm. And Stamets is like, no, you were great. And she's like, no, dummy, I wasn't. And I think it's amazing because as we've seen this change in Stamets, you know, now we have Reno again to be the more Stamets of Stamets, but we've seen this massive shift in Stamets, and he's about to get kicked in the teeth, because in a minute, he's about to find out that he's the reason why she's being attacked. Yeah. Okay, so before we get to that, I want to just, again, pull on that theme of empathy, because, you know, we get it with the sphere and Burnham and all of that, but we see it here. It's this parallel that Stamets knows and probably is betting that Tilly was and had empathy for May. And when she's doubting herself, Stamets is the one to say, and has empathy for her. Like we're getting empathy in the mirror because he's saying, you know, you probably were just fine to her. Don't beat yourself up. Like he had empathy for her. She, and he knows that he, that I'm sorry, he knows that she's the most empathetic person that he knows. So I think that that's that theme of empathy is in the A and B plot, as you say, and we see it here in engineering as well with Tilly and Stamets. We see it throughout. Yeah, yeah. we absolutely see it throughout the entire episode. We, the only person who doesn't have empathy seems to be Reno. Yeah. And, and she does later, actually, but to the to this point, she's just kind of like, yeah, I'll fix that with duct tape. Yeah. yeah, I'll fix that analogy with duct tape. I love that line. Oh, my gosh. I love it so much. And then Stamets the comes back. Acts. Yeah, that's the salad dressing. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> But even in that scene, she's kind of like, yeah, okay, dumb. I know. We're past this. We, we've already moved. I'm the in. You're, you're, uh, oh, what did she say? I'm the insultable, the uninsultable uh, or whatever. Uninsultable. Yeah, like, I love that. So, but that's, it's perfect because that's what I'm talking about. Like in my profession, that's who, you have to be her to survive to some degree. And uh, 
And it's sad because I'm somewhat guilty of it too. Like if you find, like I have a friend Mike, man, and we knew. If I don't really know you, I won't do it. But like my friend Mike, man, we knew what his buttons were, and I pushed him every morning. And like, I drove. I mean, I drove him insane half the time. There is no way I could be in your profession because I would crack like a <laughs> soft little egg or something. <laughs> I would start I, crying every day. I can't. I yeah, can't that, do that kind that of humor. Well. <laughs> I'm too. I have too much empathy. That's why I'm a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> we don't uh, <laughs> we're more like reno so but um but yeah so like and like even when the scene when they do the lightning rod and, and like you were saying though that's my version of the salad dressing even then she's like wow that was not a stupid idea like she doesn't even say it's a good I know, idea yeah can't she's even bear to compliment <laughs> nope it's just not a stupid one and then she goes and hold it. you're gonna do it manually well clearly you're not mm-hmm. like that's so exactly what i expect from a typical blue collared worker mm-hmm. that it makes perfect sense she's like that and maybe it doesn't other people don't like her as much for it because they're not in that industry they don't see it every day but man she's pulling this off to a T yeah so one thing again going again I think this episode was so well written is that you think that these stories are happening right one on the bridge with Saru and the sphere and then you're down in engineering with Stamets and Tilly but they collide they intersect at the point where Burnham comes down it's like oh May's taken over and uh, well why is she doing that oh we can communicate and then that's what gives her the idea we need to communicate and then they you know techno babble and engineering it but that intersection of the two stories is so brilliant that just ties it all together okay so the writing of this that that happens all that way is great I, the execution i just had one small problem with there's no reason for him to tell Burnham directly. I can talk to her with this. Burnham wasn't even the one who asked the question about talking. Well, it was Reno. He should have been saying the things he said to Burnham to Reno, and Burnham should have just overheard it. No, because Burnham was initiating the conversation. Yes, but then it goes to, well, it's not like we can just talk to her. And he's like, yes, we can. He runs over and gets the device yeah. and then runs back to Burnham. And he should have, I don't know. He should have said to Reno everything he said to Burnham at that moment. All right. You know, it's just okay. Let's put it this way: if I was writing it, that's what I would have. Done. Okay. Uh, the point is, we were still going to in both versions. We get to the same point where talking—that's what it's doing. And I, I mean, so the overall point is important here, yes. more so than the execution of that particular scene, because we still had to get to the point where Burnham realizes we're going to talk to mm-hmm. him. Yep. So, um, and I like the fact that it didn't really work at first when they tried to talk to him because they needed the cortical implant. Um, implant. Yep. But man, was that kind of rough to watch. Again, with this horror, ah, let's just take a drill. Yeah, and sing, what's your favorite song? I, I love that scene with him because it shows the full, we've now come full circle with him. We know for a fact that we're into a Stamets that's not like who we met in the beginning, that we're seeing yeah. the Stamets behind the wall that he wouldn't let people in. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And he's like, what's your favorite song? And he was in Rent, by the way. Yeah, but that song in wasn't case in case anyone didn't know. No, but he can he can sing because oh, yeah. the reason why I bring that up is I saw him in Rent. Oh, um, yeah. So this I saw is the Rent how come this stage. is the first time hearing about this? I've been I saw Rent on stage, but he was in the the movie the version that was filmed uh-huh. for Tele- video. I saw that like a million times, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, I was at one of the versions used to make the movie. Wow. So, yeah, my wife was obsessed with that play. Oh. I thought it was good, uh, but. I wasn't as obsessed as she was. We watched it a million times, though. And he's phenomenal. Yeah. Which I bring up really only because, one, haha, I got to see him years before everyone even knew who he was. And two, he actually purposely holds back singing in this scene, mm-hmm. which cannot be easy for someone who spent a long time singing for a living. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just found that fascinating that he didn't sing to his utmost ability because he's supposed to be sad when he's singing this song. Mm-hmm. And he pulled it off. Yeah. And Mary did a fine job. Oh, she did a great singing job. Singing in her hallucinated state. Yeah. I only bring him up because I know exactly how well he can sing from seeing him in Rent. Yeah. Um, I don't know how well she can sing. I'm sure it's way better than she did there because she was, again, scared. Mm-hmm. 
you know. But uh, but if you put me in that scene, I can't sing at all. So I would sound scared no matter how I was supposed to be. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, I'm just terrible at singing. Um, but I just, I found it interesting. And I also wanted to plug that I've seen Rent. Yes. <laughs> Did you have anything else that you wanted to talk in engineering? Um, well, I, I think it's interesting that the the blob may can change its size. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to bring that up. Yeah, I, I found it interesting. Um when we see it leave her chest in the episode previously, it's small. Mm-hmm. It gets caught in the bubble. Now when we come back, it's already in the spore chamber, right? The navigation chamber for the spore drive anyway. Yep. I don't know what they call it exactly. And it's kind of big. And I thought it was amazing. He's like, oh, this seems like uh, just a blob, but it's one of the most sophisticated life forms and I've sentient. ever seen. It's right. So it's sentient, which we see when it puts its hand up, just like in a horror movie, it touches hands with Tilly yeah. and she like jumps back and screams. But she, just before that, he talks about the mycelium network doesn't just connect life. It actually contains it. Yeah. And then she's like, like a house. Yeah. yeah. It was a great set of lines and a great scene because now we're learning a lot more about this mycelium network. And Brandon, you can be rest assured knowing that we are eventually getting to the point where they're not going to use the spore drive anymore. Right. At all. Yeah. You know, um, which is good because this is a way better explanation for why they never use it again mm-hmm. than, oh, well, we really don't like that Stamets was using it. Let's never use it. Right. Again. That was, to me, that was garbage because you just find something that can drive it without him and you, that's what you do. Yep. But now that we find out we're destroying it, we're doing exactly what happened in the mirror universe. Yes. They're definitely going to stop. Yep. Yeah. Cause you could see, how that affected Stamets when he found out, like, I'm causing this. He's like, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I will stop. I will you do what it takes, you yep. know. And it's amazing because just before this, he's talking about, oh, this is renewable. It doesn't hurt anyone. Yes. Like, he was being, he was kind of acting like a hippie, you know. Oh, like, absolutely. And and she was like, yeah, well, gasoline works better. Yep. You know, and she was, she was like the old crow who wasn't going to listen to any newfangled, interesting ways of doing things. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was interesting and a good commentary on on our yeah, ecosystem. Renewable versus fossil fuels. Yep. I mean, that was that was exactly what they were talking about there, which I find amazing. Yeah. Because we definitely need to get off them eventually. Yep, we do. They're not going to last forever, period. It might not, you know, whatever. I don't know what your political views are, listener, and you might think that they're going to last two more years or two million more years, but at some point they're going to run out. Yes. It's just a fact. I don't know what that time frame is. So at some point this is going to be an issue. Mm-hmm. And we find out that maybe not all of them are so great either Mm -hmm. because they might be doing other damage. So we really need to make sure whatever we do, we're not harming other ecosystems. Yeah. All right. And finally to our Spock chase down, we're still chasing after him and it was a very minor. And I think this is just the tie in that's, you know, going over this entire season of, you know, trying to catch Spock. And we get number one who gives us the warp trail that she was able to investigate behind closed doors. Okay. So I had a few things. So we get number one, which is pretty awesome. Yes. Um, the way they did her hair and makeup, by the way. I loved it because it looks like it belongs when the original cage was actually filmed. Yes, I thought like, so too. It, it's she looks like she belongs in an episode from the sixties, uh, which was pretty cool. The the just the, the red that they used for the lipstick and the way the hair was done. Um, the line about I don't know if they'll ever have and Ep- Enterprise will ever have a chief engineer who loves it as much. Awesome line. I love that little tie in. Uh, that that might be a little over the top fan service because people like my wife don't understand that yeah. line. But it didn't play a big enough role to matter. So, you know, if you just kind of listen past it, it doesn't change the episode for you. Um, They're doing a lot in this episode to tie up a lot of loose ends for people, too, which I like because we don't see holograms. You know, one of the I didn't have a complaint on this, but a lot of people complained. Oh, what's these holograms for? Why are we looking at holograms? They never had it before. It doesn't matter because they're talking about how they suck and they look too much like ghosts and I don't like using them. You know, and we had... a. A scene earlier we had where Pike says, uses it, and the guy's like, only you and my grandmother still use view screens. Well, now we have an answer for why T- in TOS, the Enterprise only uses view screens. Mm-hmm. Because they took them out of the Enterprise. Right. They got rid of the holograms. That's it. Yep. We don't have to talk about that no more. Yeah. Fix that problem, you know, which is awesome. We do know that there is an engineer who loves Enterprise even more than this current chief engineer but so I, I thought that was cool and um, and then we get to the reason why number one is interest, 
is brought on to the ship to talk to Pike, and it's to to basically say she stole information, and you don't need to know the details because you know plausible deniability. Yeah, and again, emphasizing the fact that both Pike and Number One are going to do whatever it takes, and building that family that we know on TOS. Well, what I love is they they talk about the fact that the clearance level has become level one, which is too high for a line officer. So this this now still begs the question. Spock probably didn't kill anybody. Mm-hmm. He probably didn't, and they're they're framing him. Someone's framing him for something. Mm-hmm. Because why would you make that that high of a level for someone of his position? It you know even Pike and Number One don't understand why that happens. Right. You know, it, part of the story. So the, yeah, you're right. Uh, going back for a second, you were right. This this just kind of bookends the episode, mm-hmm. just so that we can keep it tied into the rest of yeah. Keep the story the continuing. Story. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, we still had other things tying it into the season. We had the the Tilly thing or whatever, but this is really the main focus of the season right. is finding Spock at this point. And so we bookend it with this. Yeah. Go and ahead. again, like this intersection between this storyline and with the Michael and Saru, like now Michael understands the importance of a brother and sister and that you can forgive and that you can have empathy. And so then at the end, you know, Michael's like, you know, I'm going to find Spock. So keep me in the loop. I want to be the one to reach out to him because I've learned now through this experience that, you know, forgiveness and I'm not going to give up on Spock. And again, just the intersection of the storylines of how they just come together so brilliant in this episode. S- seamless. Yeah. The word I would use is all of these stories tie together seamlessly. I Even the one in engineering, which has really not much to do with everything else going on, they still found a way to tie it yep. in and, and believably so that you don't have to put a lot of headcanon in to make sure that this makes sense. Yep. You know, you have, uh, and with this, you have her, I'm not, I don't want to be around Spock. I'll just make things worse. I We can't, you know, I screwed up too much. Don't involve me. And Pike's like, I don't know. As much as I trust you, I know better than you do. You need to be involved. Then at the end of the episode, he's like, I've rethought it. And you're right. I won't force you to be there if you don't want to. So I'll just keep you uninvolved. And she's like, well, I've, I've rethought that. Because if me and Saru can make up for all the things we did to each other and all the fighting we had over the years. exactly, And he can see me as, as his, his sister. And I can see him as my brother. And we can love each other the way we do. Then clearly the same can be done with Spock because we were family. Maybe not biologically, but we lived together. We were actually family. And I don't want to miss my chance to make up with him like, like I had just made up recently with Saru. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So we, gosh, sure did talk the heck out of this episode. Are there... There's so much more. I know. I know. Are there any final thoughts you have for an obel to Karan? Okay. So I love this episode. I am I'm gonna, still going to say episode two is my favorite, but this could easily be better than that, ranked higher than that one. Um, it just feels... It's just however I feel at that moment. A few things I wanted to talk about. I found it interesting that the Mycelial Network's defense mechanism is uh, a hallucinogen it puts out. It gave it to Tilly, then it put it out in the air, and that scene was pretty well hit me. Why? I need to snap out of this. Like, And then she cracks him in the face, and then he shoots him with the um, anti-hallucinogen or whatever. But So I found that interesting. I found it, again, I, like I said, I love the fact that P- uh, Pike says the holograms look like ghosts, because I always thought they kind of looked like ghost and uh i didn't really like them either so i'm glad they're going to be kind of going away at this point um i love the fact that we are no longer going to deal with these stupid threat ganglia in any way shape or form they're gone they're dead they don't exist that's it he's not even scared anymore which i can't wait to see where this goes now that he's going to be a more assertive saru this is going to be great and uh other than that i like the fact that that we saw Pike come up to, to come up with the morality of having to save the knowledge, not just the duty to do so. Uh, so all in all, I love this episode, and I lo- really love the way season two is going. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the parallels of the storylines and how they intersect one with another—they uh, are—they're seamless, like you said. They reflect one another the stories belong together yet are so different and separate from each other it's so wonderful to see this 
the wonderful trek ideas of exploring and, you know, and again, that first contact, last contact, that the whole scenario is just so beautiful. Um, really, really enjoyed this episode. And I, I can't rank them because I, I've just liked them all. And <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> they, they all have been pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, it's been fun talking about an obol for Karen today, but it isn't the only thing we've been discussing here on the network. So here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM, The Ready Room. And, and again, the Kelvins, they're enjoyable to me, but I'm so thrilled I don't have to hang, you know, whatever the need was for them in 2006. That's been 13 years ago. I mean, talk yeah. about water under the bridge and how much things have changed. The way the world looked, media and Star Trek land looked in 2006, and what the emotion and the vibe and all that was, is completely different now, and these movies are a holdover from that, and that's fine. But they, the, our Star Trek world does not depend on them. Earl Grey. It's nice that she gets some revenge at the end because they reverse the whole connection to find them right but at the same time that doesn't like the ends do not justify the means literary treks but tilly feels she's failed and i think when you're at that age failure feels almost um like it's going to annihilate you because you're still quite fragile your your sense of self is still quite fragile that if something goes wrong you think it's the end of the world and in fact it's so the the, the secret of course being a, gr- a grown-up is that when things go wrong you still feel like it's the end of the world but you kind of pick yourself up a bit more quickly but tilly hasn't had those experiences it's always been success the orb on top of that, the Ferengi going to the Mirror Universe gives us the opportunity to kind of explore one last time the character of Quark in a way where we are able to see how he's grown. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you do leave us a uh, written review on iTunes, your name will be entered into a drawing and we will, at the end of the season two, be awarding and giving out our beautiful uh, pike pins that were donated to us graciously by Chris Trebuzio, one of our associate producers. producers. So please uh, go ahead, get us that, and we will have a drawing at the end of season two, which I believe is <gasps> eight more weeks for yeah. yeah. We're four in and we have 12, right? No, we have 14. So we're four in. So, so we're four in. So 10 more weeks. Oh my gosh. But, but, but by the time you hear this, it'll probably already be the fifth episode over. So it'll actually be nine episodes left. Yes. Either way, leave us a star. <laughs> Leave us a, a star rating and written review on iTunes for your chance to win a Captain Pike pin from Fansets. Now, if you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, YouTube, Windows Phone, and most third-party apps. And you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join the larger conversation is the Babel Conference. That's our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send a show and select the edge. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. So, Amy, where can people find you when you're not verifying information that people like me feed you about the density of Earth? Well, when I'm not doing that, you can find me here on the network on Earl Grey with my good friends Richard and Justin, where we talk about the next generation, like I did quite a bit in this episode. All those TNG references, gotta love them. 
You can find me on the Fandom Podcast Network, where I discuss the Orville and Discovery on Discoville with Haley Stoddart, Kyle Wagner, and Kevin Reitzel. You can find me on Twitter at TrekFM. Uh, you can find me on Postcards from the Edge, where we talk about your fan response to Discovery. But my favorite place is right there in the Babel Conference. So, Patrick, where can people reach you when you're not using duct tape to fix everything? Oh, I own a house and I'm an electrician. Yeah. That's all I ever fix things with. <laughs> I have duct tape everywhere. But between actually using it, you can find me uh, popping up in the Babel Conference more often lately. I've uh, actually been interacting as much as I can with the listeners and because uh, I like it. It's fun to do. I've also... Um, you can find me on Twitter at Magic Drop Five. I, I don't post there as much as I do the Babel Conference, and um, you can find me on Warp Five with some combination of Brandon and Brandy. Yeah, and you can also check me out at Big Apple Comic Con, uh, March 9th and 10th. I'll be there, and there are going to be a bunch of uh, Star Trek signings. So if you want to meet some Star Trek characters or hang out with me, that's where I'll be. Very good. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website, The Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these shows each month. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. We'd also like to thank our Tower of Babel, different languages, our associate producers, Norman C. Lau, Tony Robinson, Thomas Puleo, Lisa Slack, Shoeb Mirsa, Richard Rutless, James Muldrow, Cornelia Reutner, Ryan Millette, Chris Rubuzio, and Brian Maloche. Thank you for supporting Trek FM, and in particular, The Edge. Thank you for listening, and join us next time to see what's happening on The Edge of Federation Space.